Hello, I'm Dr. Sandeep Atre. My domain of expertise is emotional and social intelligence, and I am founder of Socialigence, a venture that specializes in the development of social and emotional intelligence through its online courses and customized workshops. I am also author of two books, Understanding Emotions Logically and Observing Nonverbal Behavior. In last 18 years, I have coached professionals, educators, and students. And today, I am here to help you learn how to attune to students by applying emotional and social intelligence. So let's begin. So what is emotional and social intelligence? Well, I have already covered this topic in details in one of earlier videos of the series. So I encourage you to go through that video as well. However, for the sake of setting the foundation for this session, let's revise the part of that session which is important for us in context of this topic. Simply put, emotional and social intelligence is essentially the science of managing self and connecting with others. It can be defined as the ability to adapt one's behavior on the basis of awareness of one's own emotions and attunement with others' emotions. Yes, it is the foundation skill of all interpersonal and intrapersonal competencies. As you can see, social and emotional intelligence has three components, awareness, attunement, and adaptability. Awareness is observing subtle cues and underlying dynamics in both self and social environment. Attunement is accurately interpreting these observations for cognitive and emotional empathy, and adaptability is utilizing those interpretations to customize one's behavior for interpersonal synchrony. Well, emotional and social intelligence is not just some talent one is born with. It is a skill that can be learned, practiced, and mastered. So with this base of emotional and social intelligence, let's get back to our topic for this session, how to attune to students by applying emotional and social intelligence. As we just discussed in Socialigence ESI model, attunement is observing others and interpreting those observations for cognitive and emotional empathy. That is observing or interpreting what is going on inside and between people around you to understand the emotions and mindset. So for attunement, we have to understand someone's thoughts as well as emotions because together they shape a person's behavior and actions. Yes, though we call ourselves homo sapiens, the thinking beings, Beneath our intelligent, educated selves, the real shapers of our lives day in, day out are our emotions. That's why most people react on the basis of emotions and even those who don't do find their emotions continuously playing an intervening role in their choices. Thus, if we can understand people's emotions, then we can relate to them in a far more meaningful way. Now, as far as thoughts are concerned, words are major carriers of thoughts. Now, though it seems obvious that words express emotions as well, the fact is that words can at best express your thoughts on your emotions, but not the emotions. Emotions can be expressed only through nonverbal behavior of body, that is through language of the body. Yes, as we say at Socialigence, words express thoughts and body expresses emotions. And there is a specific reason to why Nonverbal behavior is such a trustworthy representation of emotions. While our verbal behavior is guided more by cortex, the advanced and deliberate part of our brain, our nonverbal behavior is guided more by our evolutionarily older brain parts, limbic system and brainstem, which are much more emotional, reactive, and unregulated. That's precisely why nonverbal behavior expresses our emotions so authentically. And it is important to observe nonverbal behavior for these authentic emotions because if you can get cues to someone's emotional state, then you can have a better prediction of the choices they might make and thus can be more prepared with the most apt response on your part. You can use this knowledge for your benefit as well as for the benefit of others. For instance, if you can spot early stage of anger in someone's behavior, then you can do something to offset a potentially unfavorable outcome. Or in a classroom, if you can read cues of discomfort in a student who is unable to express it, then you may extend a helping hand. This is what we mean by attuning to students. Yes. 
Now the question is what to observe in nonverbal behavior? Well, there are many constituents of nonverbal behavior and academic literature has given a name to the study of each one of them. Yet simply put, broadly nonverbal behavior is studied through the constituents of gestures, postures, vocal cues and expressions. Now while studying gestures, postures and vocal cues can tell you the emotional state a person is in, only the face can tell you the exact emotion the person is feeling. Yes, there are specific facial expressions pertaining to each of the emotions. These expressions are the legacy of our evolution, are unadulterated and have been found to be universal. You might say that these facial expressions can always be controlled or mocked. Well, even when they are controlled, in the initial stage of an emotional stimulation, there is a short leakage or seepage of such expressions. They are often called micro expressions, which can be spotted with observation and practice. Now the question is, how many universal discrete emotions can the face show? Well, putting together the works of Charles Darwin, Duchesne, Ernst Huber, Robert Plutchik and Sylvan Tompkins, two famous researchers Paul Ekman and Wallace V. Friesen found that there are seven emotions that human face can convey. They are surprise, fear, disgust, contempt, anger, happiness and sadness. The facial expressions of these emotions are universal. However, what elicits the emotion and when that emotion is shown depends on a person's personal, social and cultural factors. You may ask that if by observing someone's bodily signals, we can pick signs of discomfort, interest or enthusiasm, then why should we try to interpret the exact emotion? Well, that's the difference between a commonsensical layman and a person with emotional and social intelligence. Only by identifying the exact emotion can one choose the most apt and purposeful response. For instance, if a teacher is discussing disagreement with students, then it is important to spot whether the student is feeling contempt, disgust or anger. Because in each case, what is required to be done on teacher's part would differ. This ability to fine tune or refine one's responses in behavioral situations is at the heart of emotional and social intelligence. Now, if we talk about universal expressions of seven basic emotions, each of them has a specific nuanced configuration in three parts of the face, upper, middle and lower. Yes, to spot an emotion, it is important to be conversant with their characteristic features. Two important points here. First is spread. An emotion's spread conveys its intensity. A more intense emotion will manifest in the multiple parts of the face and less intense emotion will show in fewer parts. Second point is simultaneity. Often, we humans feel two emotions simultaneously. In that case, one emotion manifests in any one or two parts of the face and the other one in the remaining parts. Well, human face is capable of making over 10,000 expressions and around 3,000 of them are relevant to emotions and their expression. These seven basic emotions create multiple permutations and combinations and convey different meanings and messages. Add to it the various possible movement forms of eyes, eyebrows, mouth and lips and you have numerous meanings and messages being conveyed. As a teacher, I would love to get into those details, yet due to constraints of time and scope, we will only focus on seven basic emotions. Let's discuss about the expressions of these seven emotions one by one in details. Oh, before that, just one final point. Please remember that what we are going to see are the expressions of seven basic emotions when these emotions are experienced in their full intensity. We are doing so because it will help us understand the most representative facial configuration of these emotions. Remember that you will rarely ever see such expressions in your classroom, hopefully. In your classroom and interactions, you will typically see subtle partial forms of these expressions which is understandable as the students will normally feel these emotions to milder extent and not in their full intensity. Well, to help you get a feel of that, we'll have some clips of those subtle partial expressions towards the end. However, as we discussed, first let's see expressions of seven basic emotions one by one in details. Let's start with the expression of surprise. In surprise, in the upper portion of the face, both corners of brows are raised. 
due to lifting of the whole brows, horizontal wrinkles appear across the forehead. In surprise, in the middle portion of the face, the skin below the brows becomes more visible. Eyes get opened wide, but only upper eyelids get raised and lower eyelids remain relaxed. Due to this, eyes white portion sclera becomes visible above the iris. Normally, the sclera below the iris is not visible except when surprise is so intense that the jaw gets dropped really very low. In surprise, in the lower portion of the face, jaw drops vertically and due to that, the lips part and so do the teeth. However, lips don't get tightened or stretched back. They remain relaxed. In the full-fledged surprise, all three parts of the face are equally involved and when there is a variation in spread or blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. Now let's talk about the expression of fear. In fear, in the upper portion of the face, the brows are raised, but unlike in surprise, only the inner corners of the brows are drawn closer together and outer corners remain straight. Horizontal wrinkles appear on forehead, but they are not spread on forehead as in case of surprise. In fear, in the middle portion of the face, eyes are opened wide, upper eyelids get raised, but unlike in surprise, here the lower lids are also raised and are tense. In fear, in the lower portion of the face, mouth opens, but lips are tense and are stretched horizontally or drawn back tightly at the corners. In full-fledged fear, all three parts of the face are equally involved and when there is a variation in spread or there is a blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. Now let's talk about the expression of disgust. To feel disgust is to feel a sense of aversion and desire to block something out. It is felt towards something which is physically, socially or morally repulsive. Now let's talk about the expression of disgust. Disgust shows in the lower and middle parts of the face. In disgust, there is main involvement of lower portion of the face, that is mouth. The upper lip gets raised. Moreover, the lower lip either gets raised or gets lowered and comes slightly forward. In disgust, in the middle portion of face, there is a change in the appearance of the tip of the nose, which is an effect of the prominent movement of upper lip. Due to it, wrinkles appear along the sides and bridge of the nose. In this process, cheeks get raised, because of which the opening of the eyes narrows and some lines and folds appear below the eyes. In full-fledged disgust, both parts of the face are equally involved. And when there is a variation in spread or there is a blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. Now let's talk about the expression of contempt. To feel contempt is to feel intellectually, socially or morally superior to someone. Yes, in it, rather than a feeling of distancing, there is a feeling of looking down upon someone. In contempt, there is main involvement of face's lower portion, that is mouth. Contempt mostly is a unilateral expression in which there is a slight pressing of the lips and a raising of lip corner on one side of the face. Sometimes it is bilateral, with the corners tighten on both sides of the mouth. When there is a variation in spread or there is a blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. Now let's talk about the expression of anger. In anger, in the upper portion of the face, the inner corners of the eyebrows are drawn together but are lowered. This lowering can be flat or angling slightly downward. Due to this, vertical wrinkles appear in the area between the eyebrows. In anger, in the middle portion of the face, eyelids get tensed. There is also narrowing of the upper part of the eye. Eyes appear to stare out in a hard penetrating manner. Moreover, there is also a nose flare, which is the most reliable indicator of anger. In anger, in the lower portion of face, mouth takes any of the two shapes. First, in which the upper lip is pressed tightly against the lower lip. This happens when person is trying to control shouting or when they are in the mood of attacking someone physically. In 
The second one, mouth gets opened and takes a sort of square shape. This happens more in the verbal expression of anger. In full-fledged anger, all three parts of the face are equally involved and when there is a variation in spread or there is a blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. Now let's talk about the expression variants of non-laughing happiness. In happiness, in the middle portion of the face, eyes narrow slightly and there is a distinctive shine in them. The skin below the lower eyelids is pushed up and lines are visible below the eyes. Apart from this, most importantly, wrinkles resembling crow feet appear around the outer corners of the eyes. Moreover, wrinkle lines run from the nose out and right down to the area beyond the corners of the lips. These nasolabial folds are the most characteristic feature of genuine smile. As a result, cheeks also get raised so the face looks fuller. In happiness, in the lower portion of the face, the corners of the lips go up and are drawn back. The lips may remain together or may be parted with the teeth showing. In fact, the position of the lips primarily represents the intensity of happiness. In full-fledged happiness, both parts of the face are equally involved and when there is a variation in spread or there is blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. Now let's talk about the expression of sadness. In sadness, in the upper portion of the face, the inner corners of eyebrows get raised and are even drawn together. Sad eyebrows have a triangular shape which is different from fear. Due to it, a vertical line of wrinkles gets visible in middle of the forehead. In the middle portion of the face, if sadness increases, then lower eyelids also get raised. Often the eyes are slightly cast down, specifically if a bit of guilt or shame is blended with sadness. In sadness, in the lower portion of the face, the corners of lips tend to go down. There may also be accompanying trembling. In full-fledged sadness, all three parts of the face are equally involved. And when there is a variation in spread or there is a blending of other emotions, other variants of emotions get expressed. So these were the expressions of seven basic emotions. Well, remember that the emotion expressed by student is not felt necessarily because of you. It could be because of the subject or topic or content or methodology or a fellow student or one's own self. Thus, when you observe what, it is important to delve further to know the why. That takes us to the three caveats before you apply the knowledge you gained in this session. First, utilize this knowledge to understand people, not to judge them. Second, utilize this knowledge to be curious and not be conclusive. And third, utilize this knowledge to create hypotheses, but be ready to drop them as more relevant info comes. Well, now let's discuss the last section of this session. You remember, I had said that you will rarely ever see expressions of these full-fledged, full-intensity emotions from students. In your classroom and interactions, you will typically see subtle partial forms of these expressions. To help you get a feel of that, now let's have some clips of those subtle partial expressions and for each of them, let's briefly talk about what it could mean and what to be done. Clip 1. This is expression of contempt. Depending on the context, it could mean that the student didn't find the point relevant. The student found the point too simplistic. The student did not agree with the point but thought that you would anyhow justify it. The student doubted your eligibility to say what you said. Now you have to factor in, observe, analyze, delve and connect the dots to respond aptly. This is the expression of disgust. Depending on the context, it could mean that the student didn't like what happened or found something repulsive. The student felt irritated due to something. The student is just not able to fathom something. There is a feeling of, I have had enough. Now you have to factor in, observe, analyze, delve and connect the dots to respond aptly. Clip 3. This is the expression of surprise. Depending on the context, it could mean that the student felt disbelief or didn't understand where something came from. 
the student had a questioning or evaluative attitude towards something. Now you have to factor in, observe, analyze, tell and connect the dots to respond aptly. Clip 4. This is the expression of fear. Depending on the context, it could mean that the student felt afraid of something or taken aback by something. The student felt nervous about something. Now you have to factor in, observe, analyze, tell and connect the dots to respond aptly. Clip 5. This is the expression of sadness. Depending on the context, it could mean that the student felt concerned or was anxious about something. Now you have to factor in, observe, analyze, tell and connect the dots to respond aptly. Clip 6. This is the expression of anger. Depending on the context, it could mean that the student felt upset about something, the student felt skeptic towards something. Now you have to factor in, observe, analyze, tell and connect the dots to respond aptly. So this was about expressions, which now you can observe and interpret to attune to students and take an important step towards developing as well as applying emotional and social intelligence. I, Dr. Sandeep Atre, would like to thank you for listening and wish you great fulfillment and success in the profession of teaching.